This web clip provides an overview of defining brain areas using patterns of resting state correlations. My name is Gugan Wig, and I'm an assistant professor at the Center for Vital Longevity at the University of Texas at Dallas. So before we get into resting state correlations and how they can be used to identify brain areas and or understand brain organization, I want to spend a few moments discussing how cognitive neuroscience has gone about actually defining what a brain area is. The brain is organized at multiple scales of information processing, ranging from molecules all the way up to the level of systems. And cognitive neuroscience as a field largely focuses on brain organization and function at the level of areas. One reason for this is that brain measurements using approaches such as functional and anatomical imaging are typically made at the millimeter scale. This makes them capable and appropriate for studying cortical areas and subdivisions of subcortical structures. So given that we typically study brain areas, it's important to ask what defines a brain area. One way to define a brain area is to examine the extent to which it can be differentiated from other regions of the brain based on a given set of properties. And four properties that have been widely examined are listed here. So as you probably expect, distinct areas have unique functions, but areas can also have distinct patterns of cyto, milo, and chemo architecture. And the Brobman map that most should be familiar with are based on some of these distinctions. Many areas can also be defined by their unique patterns of connectional inputs and outputs, um, sort of its fingerprint of connectivity in that case. And finally, at least in sensory cortex, distinct areas can exhibit ordered topographic maps of sensory surfaces to cortical locations. And this would include areas exhibiting organization related to either retinal or frequency space in terms of visual or auditory areas, respectively. Now, it's really important to note that not all properties may be able to differentiate two given areas, but that really is the convergence of these multiple types of information that would give us greater confidence in deline delineating where areas are. Having said that, primary area visual, uh, visual area one serves as a really good example of exhibiting all four of these properties, which distinguish it from the adjacent cortical area V2. So neurons in V1 are selectively tuned to different directions of visual um, orientation, and in this case, mo uh, motion. V1 can be characterized by its thick band of myelinated axon layer 4, called the stria of Janari. V1 has a unique pattern of inputs and outputs to other locations of the brain. And finally, each hemisphere's V1 exhibits a retinotopic map of the complete contralateral hemifield which transitions at the V1, V2 border. So those are some of the ways we can go about defining areas, but it's worth asking, why is it important to do this? And just to put that another way, why do we need to be able to parcelate brain areas? The answer, of course, is that in order to really understand how the different parts of the brain work together to give rise to cognition, we need to know where they are. And while representations such as the Broadman map have been really instrumental in helping us achieve this goal, there is still considerable work to be done. As an example, a large portion of the occipital lobe is labeled Broadman's area uh, 19. And we now know that this territory has multiple vis uh, distinct visually responsive areas within it. So it's important to, that we continue to examine and refine this work. Fortunately, the tools and methods of cognitive and systems neuroscience allow us to move forward, and you've seen examples of this throughout this textbook. In this regard, non-invasive functional brain imaging is often used to infer the function of, of an area uh, by allowing us to map cognitive processes to brain locations, and also to obtain topographic maps of sensory surfaces. However, it's tough to do all the tasks in all the subjects you want to parcelate, and it's also not clear what all the right tasks would be. So what I'm going to spend the rest of the time describing is a use of a different blood-related signal to parcelate brain areas, specifically resting state correlations. I'm going to largely focus on a manuscript recently published by Steve Peterson, Tim Lawman, and myself at NeuroImage. And at the time of making of this video, the manuscript is available via advanced online publication. First, however, I'll describe what resting state correlations are.
So Bharat Bizwal and his colleagues were the first to use fMRI to reveal that the brain exhibits an intrinsic functional organization at lower frequencies. So support for this was largely gathered by looking at the functional correlational structure of the brain while participants uh, lie, uh, laid awake in the scanner staring at a fixation crosshair. And just to give you an example of this observation, you could take a region of interest. In this case, I'm going to use a region in the primary motor cortex. And you could plot its bold signal over time for an individual while at rest. So as you might expect, this signal kind of rises and falls uh, over time. But given that there's no presentation of a stimulus or a task, uh, there's no obvious systematic change in the signal. However, if you plot the signal from the homotopic M1 region, Rather than also looking differently random, there is incredible correspondence between the two signals. Given that the two regions are highly functionally related, you might suspect that the resting state signal is reflective of this shared functioning. And in support of this, an alternate region of interest, placed in a location not typically involved with motor function, exhibits a very different pattern of signal change. Taking this one step further, a seed-based correlation map can be produced, where all locations that exhibit a high correlation with that initial region of interest, or in our case, uh, left M1, are plotted. And as you can see here, the resting state correlation map reveals a collection of regions across the brain's cortical and subcortical locations. Importantly, what they all have in common is that they're all related to somatomotor function. So our initial motor region of interest exhibits a high degree of correlation with other functionally similar regions, even while the subject is not performing a motor task. And as, you, as these correlations can be observed in the absence of overt task demands, we refer to these as resting state correlations. So before proceeding, um, with describing how we can use this intrinsic organization to parcelate brain areas, I want to highlight a few important points uh, regarding resting state correlations. First, the correlations persist under varying levels of anesthesia and stages of sleep. Second, they are not maps of anatomical connectivity. There are a number of observations that demonstrate that resting state correlations are mediated by both direct and indirect anatomical connectivity. Third, present thinking is that resting state correlations likely reflect a statistical signature of coactivation, such that brain regions that are commonly used together exhibit high correlation at rest. And this relates to the final point, that resting state correlations can reveal relationships between uh, the brain's cortical and subcortical regions across many brain systems, and simultaneously, and this provides evidence that it's not simply a product of overt thought or action. So altogether then, this suggests that resting state correlations may be used as a property with which to identify distinct brain areas. So how, how, might, how might we do this? What I'm depicting here is an inflated cortical representation of the left hemisphere. At the top, you can see the resting state correlation map of a seed region placed in the angular gyrus. And at the bottom, you can see the correlation map of a seed region placed in the supramarginal gyrus. While these locations are not very distant from one another, they exhibit very different patterns of resting state correlations. The region in angular gyrus is largely correlated with regions of the default network, including the middle frontal gyrus and the lateral inferior temporal cortex. In contrast, the supramarginal region is correlated with the anterior insula and inferior frontal gyrus, and a superior parietal lobe. But it's not correlated with regions that the angular gyrus is correlated with, and I've highlighted one of them um, in, this, uh, in the circles here and here. So given these observations, it's reasonable to assume that we've interrogated two regions of interest that are within two distinct areas. As with other properties of parsing the brain, we hypothesize that distinct brain areas should exhibit distinct patterns of resting state correlations, but that a given brain area should have a relatively consistent pattern of resting state correlations across its extent. And if that's the case, and we've actually identified two distinct areas based on these maps, there should be a location where the correlation pattern exhibits a transition from one map to the other, 
And we can determine that um, by examining the correlation maps along a line of regions placed between the angular and supermarginal endpoints. So this figure illustrates the results of doing so. What I'm showing you here is a resting state map of each of the regions of, uh, along, the, uh, along the line between the supermarginal ROI and the angular ROI. What I'm also plotting is how similar a given region's map is to every other map. So what you can see is that if you start from the supermarginal gyrus and its map, the maps are extremely similar to one another as we march along that line. However, there's a point at which the pattern suddenly and drastically changes, and then all of a sudden there's a very different but also stable map, and that map is one that looks really similar to the angular gyrus map. The plot on the bottom depicts the spatial similarity of a given map to every other map and I've color-coded them based on the regions above. So as you can see, all the orange regions have maps that are very similar to one another, but have very different maps from the blue regions in terms of their spatial correlation. And likewise, the blue regions are all very similar to one another, but are very different from the maps uh, that, have been, that have come from regions that are color-coded orange. The pink location uh, up here or region R5, has a map that's not highly similar to one set or the other. It's a location where the resting state pattern changes. Given that we are hypothesizing that distinct areas have distinct patterns of resting state correlations, identifying these locations, these locations of transition, or is a method of identifying a putative boundary between two areas. So we could take this basic approach and apply it to locations across the brain to identify putative aerial boundaries. And that's presented here. So just to orient you, what I'm depicting is the average resting state parcellation map from a large group of healthy young adults. This map reflects a probability that a given location was a location of transition in the pattern of resting state correlations. And the precise details of how we go from the ideas I just presented to the map here is outlined in the paper. Locations in hot colors exhibit a high transition likelihood or are possible boundaries between areas, while locations in cooler colors exhibit more local stability. The resting state patterns don't change drastically around um, the regions that are cooler. Um, so in that case, they may be central parts of areas. And we can see that the same location that we identified as a transition point in the earlier example falls on this line, um, um, falls on this line separating a portion of the angular gyrus from a portion of the supermarginal gyrus. What we think we've defined here then is a map of aerial divisions. <clears throat> But in order to really test that, we need to return to our initial framework regarding what properties define a brain area. If resting state parcellations reveal area distinctions, then the map should converge with parcellation maps defined by other properties we have available to us. To test this, we performed a number of meta-analyses of a large collection of task-evoked fMRI studies. Um, each of these meta-analyses was aimed at identifying brain regions that were either reliably displayed significant activity when certain tasks were performed uh, or, when, or when certain signal types were expected. And while the analyses are largely constrained by the availability of data sets, um, we were able to create a number of different meta-analytic maps, and I'll, I'll, highlight, I'll, I'll highlight a few here. Um, so as you can see here, this map reflects evoked activity in response to button pushing or a finger motor response. This map was the meta-analysis of reading-related activity, and you can see clusters of activity in mouth regions of the somatomotor cortex and the inferior temporal gyrus. And finally, this map depicts a meta-analysis of activity related to episodic memory retrieval. Now, all these locations presumably reflect the activity within brain areas in different sets of tasks or related to different signal types. The question then is whether and how uh, whether and how well resting state transitions, which presumably reflect area borders, surround these areas. And if we're really identifying borders between areas using patterns of rest, then the borders should surround these clusters. <clears throat>
So just to facilitate viewing, what I'm going to do is show you a thresholded image of the borders, wherein the very strong borders from our parcellation map are depicted. And this is what we see here. The locations of resting state defined area boundaries largely separate regions of task evoked data. You can see a border separating the dorsal medial frontal cortex from the anterior cingulate cortex here. A strong border surrounds a posterior cingulate cortex here, and so forth. There's a considerable amount of agreement between the two types, uh, two ways of defining areas. So what this suggests then is that resting state divisions correspond quite well to divisions revealed by precise mapping of task-related processing. The important thing is that resting state borders can be identified with a relatively quick scan and without a priori knowledge of the specific cognitive paradigms or contrasts that are necessary to dissociate putative areas. So next, I'm going to demonstrate that resting state transitions can parcellate V1. Now, as I mentioned, V1 can be distinguished from V2 via cyto and milo architecture, amongst other properties. And it's important to ask whether the resting state parcellation method I'm highlighting is able to reveal this distinction, as parcellating V1 serves as a type of gold standard. So these are probabilistic maps of cytoarchitecture architecture from post-mortem analysis of multiple human brains. And these probabilistic maps have been mapped to the cortical surface and have zoomed in on the medial portion of the, of the left occipital pole. On the left is the probabilistic map of V1, and on the right is V2. The borders have been drawn, uh, that have been drawn reflect strong estimates of each of these areas based on cytoarchitecture. We can zoom in on the same portion and view the resting state parcellation map and place those architectonic borders as an overlay. Um, as you can see, there's a strong boundary that follows a line separating V1 from V2. What this demonstrates is that V1 can be distinguished from V2 from the transitions in resting state correlations. This should give you a sense of the distinct patterns of correlations two regions within each of these areas may have. In hot colors, are locations more correlated with the V1 region? And in cool colors, are locations more correlated with the, uh, uh, more correlated with the V2 region? So based on distinctions in both um, local and distal correlations, we can identify the V1, V2 border. In this example, then, we have strong information from an alternate, alternate method of parcellating cortical areas, and we find a close correspondence with resting state area borders, suggesting that they can be used to parcellate the brain's cortical structures. Just to summarize some of the points I've discussed, the aim of this video has been to describe how we can define brain areas and the types of tools cognitive neuroscience has available to it for doing so. I focused on the use of resting state correlations for this purpose and highlighted three general observations. First, functionally related brain regions exhibit correlated activity in the absence of any overt task demands. Second, the locations of resting state pattern change can be mapped to reveal putative area boundaries. And finally, the resting state boundaries exhibit close correspondence with other methods of parcellating the brain. If you, like further, if you would like further information about the study I've highlighted, I've listed the complete reference here, along with a number of other very relevant papers that focus on similar approaches and their use. Finally, I mentioned my co-authors of the manuscript earlier, but much of the resting state work I've highlighted has also been a product of the work um, from a number of other individuals who are listed here and supported by a number of grants and funding agencies. Thank you for your attention.